Hello, and welcome to another edition of Questions for Lawyers. The purpose of this show is to explore some of the common questions that I get as a personal injury attorney from clients looking for other attorneys, and I try to bring in guests of those different specialties to answer those common questions and take away some of that initial fear from a consult with an attorney for the first time. My name is Jeff Edelman, and I am honored to be with Nancy Brodsky from Brodsky, Jacobs, and Brooke Law Firm. I got it right this time. You did. And uh, I've known Nancy for a long time, and I really appreciate her being with us today to talk about collaborative divorce and family law. Welcome, It's my Nancy. pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, Nancy, rather than just talk to you about family law, um, I would like to ask you about an area of your practice called collaborative divorce. You and I have talked about it before. Can right. you tell everybody a little bit about what collaborative divorce is? Sure. So collaborative divorce is a relatively new, as in about 25 years old, process for people to get a divorce without ever having to go to court, um, except for the very end where the judge basically rubber stamps the agreement that they made. For more than 90% of people, the ideal solution to the issues that are in a divorce is a negotiated settlement. And the question is, how do you get to that settlement agreement? And collaborative is a process that is a structured settlement process that helps the family get to that finish line with empowering both parents or partners to reach agreement on all issues with the help of a team getting legal advice, getting uh, relationship advice as co-parents and partners post-divorce, as well as the kind of financial information that they need and the guidance that they need to be assured that the agreements that they reach actually give effect to what they intend. So this team approach really helps both parties know that they understand all of the issues in the case, that they are making informed decisions, and that they are empowered to make those decisions for themselves rather than leave that decision up to a judge. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, this type of a process, it's not for everybody. But who would be the type of couple that this is geared towards? You know, it's true. There's no single process of divorce that is right for every family. And some people, unfortunately, are are left with the only option of fighting everything out in court. Fortunately, right. that's a really small percentage of the most high conflict people and the most high conflict cases. The overwhelming majority of cases, especially involving children, are good candidates for collaborative divorce um, or a mediation because both mediation and collaborative divorce are geared towards encouraging the settlement process and giving a settlement the best chance of being obtained by both parties. And I think especially for people with children, um, you may divorce your spouse, but you're never hopefully going to divorce your children. True. So if you have children, the truth is you're going to need to have a relationship with this person for the rest of your life, certainly for the next very many years. You probably also have extended family relationships. And the truth is collaborative divorce does the best job of helping you to preserve the good that is in the relationship and helping you focus on your role as co-parents to the children that you brought into this world, as opposed to focusing on the anger and bitterness that caused the divorce in the first place. So I guess what you're saying is with collaborative divorce, um, when there's children involved, it's an especially useful tool? Absolutely. I, I mean, I highly recommend it for anybody who has children and can say that there aren't significant 
personality or mental health or substance abuse issues in their family that would make trying to collaborate on a resolution particularly difficult. Right. And, you know, with family law situations, dissolution of marriage, divorce, uh, obviously those are about as heated as le legal issues as, as you can get. Um, yeah. But it sounds like collaborative divorce is a way to not make an already hostile situation even worse. It's That's exactly correct. In fact, um, I think the primary job of lawyers, and most people, I think, see lawyers as part of the problem in the divorce, and I understand why. Um, those jokes stem from a certain basis in reality where lawyers are often part of the problem. Um, people think of lawyers and a divorce as being going to war. Um, do anything, just don't hire a lawyer because it's going to make it all contested. Collaborative divorce and mediated divorce are the opposite. It's where lawyers are part of the solution. The lawyers are invested in the settlement process in the same way that the clients are. Their only goal in a collaborative divorce is to help the parties reach a settlement. And that goal is embodied in the principle that if in the unlikely event that a settlement is not reached, then the lawyers cannot be the lawyers that go to court and fight it out. Oh, I didn't know that. And that is a really critical piece to the collaborative process because it makes the lawyers that much more invested in the settled outcome. Because the truth is, if you're a collaborative attorney and you don't help these people reach an agreement, you failed in your primary mission. And you're out of a job. Someone else is going to go to court and litigate that case. When you hire a lawyer who's going to, who says, well, we'll see if we can settle the case. But you know, if we don't get everything we want, we can still go to court. Those kinds of threats of hanging over your head of, if we don't settle, then we're just going to go to court. The fact that that threat is basically removed in the collaborative process really is the glue that keeps the process together and keeps the team moving forward towards settlement. And it's, I believe, the reason that it's so highly effective as a settlement option. Over 90% of cases that are collaborated on in, in family law res result in a complete settlement of the issues. That's, that's impressive. Or yeah. occasionally reconciliation. It, that We consider that a different kind of success. Yes. Because if the parties are meant to stay together, that then then our job here is done. You know, I I find that fascinating that in the process, the lawyers who were involved in co the collaborative divorce process, if things go south, they're not going to be the lawyers litigating the case. And I know from many years of knowing you that you are someone that goes to trial uh, in a regular divorce case. So you have uh, you also we'll get into those fights, but you also recommend this process. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I find that fascinating that, you know, while you uh, recommend this collaborative divorce, I know you are capable of doing this the normal way that people think of, but you recommend this. I do. I recommend collaborative divorce and I recommend mediation. Different, different processes are more appropriate for different situations. And some cases are so simple and straightforward, uh, especially cases that don't involve children um, or don't involve um, really complex financial issues are often really well suited towards a guided mediation process. I always recommend that people get legal advice. Um, you wouldn't sign up for a major surgery without getting really good medical advice about the different options that might be available to you that could include surgery, but also might, Im might include things like, well, take, let's take a spinal surgery, for example. A lot of people would say that they've had serious back problems. And if the first person they talk to recommends uh, a, a serious spinal procedure that is going to involve weeks in the hospital, months of recuperation, um, 
you might want an opinion that says, you know, there may be other methodologies that can keep you from having to go through this surgery. Um, and if we use this combination of therapies like massage, electrical stimulation, acupuncture, chiropractic adjustments, physical therapies, we may be able to keep you out of surgery altogether and you could have a complete and full recovery and never have to go through that really dangerous, really serious surgical process. I think almost everybody would say, you know, let me try mm -hmm. this, this less invasive way first because you're telling me that it's got a 90% chance of success. That's how I feel about a collaborative divorce versus a litigated divorce. You should give it that 90% chance of a less invasive process before you jump to that surgical procedure of litigation. Because the one thing about litigation is it's really expensive. The second thing about it, it's really stressful and it's really inconvenient. A collaborative divorce is less expensive than a litigated divorce. It is certainly less stressful because you have a team of people working together, including a trained mental health professional whose focus as the facilitator of the settlement negotiations is to help reduce the stress that the parties are going under and to help address the emotional issues as they arise. And after all, Who's better equipped and trained to do that than a licensed mental health professional who works with couples going through divorce all the time? And in addition, it is far more convenient because all of the meetings that are needed in order to get the case resolved are, are scheduled at the convenience of the parties, or at least as much as can be accomplished that is convenient for the parties, realizing that it's all gonna be somewhat inconvenient, but at least the professionals care about when your day off is, the court really doesn't care. No, they don't. And they, you know, you <laughs> Family say, law, civil, criminal law, they do not. They just don't care. So it, it's inevitable that it's going to be far less convenient. It's inevitable that it's going to be far more stressful if you're in court. And it is almost always much more expensive. So let's say a couple's listening and they're uh, interested in getting a divorce, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, how do they go about the process of starting a collaborative divorce procedure? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, most of the time, one person walks into a lawyer's office that they have located and begins this discussion. Um, if you haven't started in a marriage counselor's office, and a lot of people go to marriage counseling as their final attempt to save the relationship, and I encourage that because everybody knows their tipping point, and you should make sure that you've hit yours before you begin the process of divorce. And if your marriage counselor hasn't recommended a collaborative divorce, hopefully you're out there looking at different options for how you're going to go about getting a divorce. And whether you're looking at divorce that, you know, is without war or divorce without fighting or uncontested divorce or amicable divorce, all of these are just different ways of saying, I don't want to leave these decisions up to a judge. I want to figure this out with the person that I am going to not be parenting and living under the same roof with anymore. And I think it's really important for anyone considering divorce to come to any lawyer asking about how they intend to get you to that finish line. Everybody is focused on what are, what's going to happen to my house, what's going to happen to my retirement plan, what is my time sharing schedule going to look like with my children. But it's really important to talk to any lawyer that you consult with about the process that they are recommending to get you there. And if you aren't talking to a lawyer who knows about collaborative divorce, I recommend that you search for collaborative attorneys in your geographical area. In our case, Broward County, we have a large number of, of lawyers who are trained in collaborative practice. And we are happy to talk to you about process and to talk to your spouse about the process. And if you are in my office, you're going to hear about collaborative divorce. 
And we're going to talk about ways in which to include your spouse in that conversation. I developed a letter for my clients to give or for me to email their spouse or their partner, because this also applies to people who were never married but have children together, right. uh, which is known legally as a paternity case. Um, although paternity may not be in question, but it's in, and, and it's also sometimes called a custody case. Um, but any so this would that, be applicable to that. Absolutely. A hundred percent, because you don't need to be married in order to need a process to come to an agreement with the other parent of your child or children. And we send out this letter and it is the nicest letter you would ever want to read from a lawyer. It's not threatening in any way, shape, or form. It's what I call an invitation to collaborate letter or invitation to mediate because I use the same format for people who are choosing mediation. Right. And, um, and it's basically an invitation. It's an invitation to learn more about the process. It's an invitation to find a lawyer who knows how to do this. Uh, it's an invitation to call me and get more information about the process and it's really important to remember that a lawyer can only represent one client. So one lawyer cannot represent two people in a divorce. One mediator can mediate the divorce for two parties, but that mediator is not able or allowed to give either party legal advice. Right. And you are an advocate, but you're also a mediator, right, Nancy? I am. I am a certified family law okay. mediator. And for some people, direct mediation with me while getting legal advice on the side from an attorney that they're consulting with is an advisable way to resolve the issues in your divorce. Some people have really agreed to almost everything. They just need it written out in a form that they know will be enforceable by the courts and will be specific enough so that they will both five years down the line still know what it was they agreed to. And if that describes your situation, then mediation may be the right choice for you as a process because the mediator can basically operate as the scribe who takes everything that you've agreed to and puts it into the format that the courts will enforce and that anybody will recognize and be able to interpret in the way in which you intended it to do when you first reached the agreement. These, for a mediation, where do those take place? Usually mediations take place in my office. Um, when I am mediating for a couple directly, I have very comfortable mediation space in my office. I have a, uh, a round table that is perfect for four or five people to sit around and work together. Um, and I also have conference room space if we need to put people in different rooms, which occasionally, mm -hmm. Um, especially in mediation where parties both have attorneys. Um, it's really not just the parties that sometimes have difficulty talking in front of their uh, spouse or partner whom they are separating and divorcing, but sometimes it's hard for a party to listen to the other person's attorney. Um, this is those cases where attorneys aren't necessarily part of the solution or the problem, but can um, occasionally say things in a way that might really not sit well with the other party and wouldn't really be helpful towards a settlement process, if you know what I mean. Right. Um, and sometimes parties in the same room, you know, everyone, when, when this gets heated, uh, it's easy to fall back into old patterns. And there's a reason that you're getting divorced. And a lot of that has to do with your communication isn't very good. And it devolves into a fight, an argument, um, throwing back up in the other person's face some of the incidents that have occurred to cause the breakdown of the marriage, especially when there's been um, either marital infidelity or financial infidelity, which can be just as devastating, if not more so in some cases. Um, it's it's hard. It's hard to negotiate these things in front of each other in a way that is always constructive. Um, 
People, after all, are still people. We're all human. And this is a very, very emotional time for most people, even under the best of circumstances, even when it's what you want, it can still be very difficult. So sometimes separating the parties into two different rooms is a necessary step towards reaching that agreement. And obviously, I think anybody could understand that. I mean, it makes intuitive yeah, yes. sense at times. Yes. And sometimes in a collaborative divorce, we take breaks. And some of my most successful collaborative cases, while a lot of it was accomplished around the negotiating table together, there were breaks that were taken in order to address issues when emotions ran high or tempers flared or a lawyer maybe became a little less collaborative in their speech than was ideal. It happens. It does. It happens. And that's where this neutral facilitator is really key in the collaborative divorce, in my opinion, because they are the person who is constantly monitoring sort of the seismic activity in the room. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who are best equipped to call a timeout and say, hold on, let's take a break for a minute. And, um, go into separate rooms and I, I'm going to address what's just happened in both rooms so that we can then hopefully come back together in, in a more productive and constructive way. And it's extremely effective. Um, I, I remember being in a collaborative case where I will be honest. Um, I represented the wife and the husband who was um, had a very sort of authoritarian and, and controlling um, personality uh, decided that they were going to try to control me and dictate things to me and point their finger at me right across the table. And um, it that that tends to trigger me. And I don't respond well yeah, I when someone's that behaving that way, especially um, a male uh, behaving in that way. And for reasons that we could talk about over <laughs> drinks sometime that tends to trigger me. And um, fortunately the facilitator knowing me well, sort of saw me, the steam rising and um, she kicked me under the table and uh, she called a break. And that was perfect because it allowed me to calm down. Uh, it allowed her to refocus the husband so that he didn't continue trying to bait me into doing something that everyone would have regretted. And, um, and it worked. And, mm -hmm. and that meeting continued to be a productive meeting. It could have very easily turned into a police report mm -hmm. um, if, if someone hadn't intervened. Oh, um, this may shock a lot of people, but lawyers are human beings. So, yes. I mean, we do, <laughs> we do yes, sometimes we do. lose our cool or uh, have certain things that, Trigger it, us. It, we all have it. And, and it takes um, it takes everything we have to sometimes control that. So if you if you're feeling triggered in a meeting, believe it, your lawyer's probably being triggered as well. They just may be better at holding it in than you are, because we've had a lot of training at this. Um, we do this a lot and um, we have to behave in court when the judge is watching, when things are being triggered in court and that happens all the time. It's really no different around the negotiating table, but what makes collaborative difficult and challenging is that we do hold ourselves to a very high standard as professionals and we have to rise above. We have to model the kind of behavior for the clients that we are encouraging them to adopt as co-parents moving forward. So, when you're hiring a trained collaborative attorney, you're hiring somebody who has taken extra training just to be really good at this um, because it's a lot easier to not have to watch your words. It's a lot easier to be adversarial and to want to fight it out. That's really how we're trained, or at least how we were trained traditionally in law school. Now, I do know that these days, lawyers, young lawyers are being trained a lot more in um, non-adversarial methods. And that's great. Um, unfortunately, very young attorneys also mean very little experience. And not every case can be handled by a lawyer of very little experience. Um, I love it when 
lawyers who don't do family law say, well, I only do one or two cases a year and I only handle simple cases. And I wouldn't go to a personal injury attorney who says that I do one or two personal injury cases a year. I stick to simple cases, but, you know, I, I, I do OK. I've taken a few CLEs on personal injury law. I would never leave my or my family's injury case up to anyone but someone of Jeff's experience, someone who does this Thank every you. day, <laughs> someone who I know can take the case to trial if, God forbid, that's what has to happen, and someone who does this and really knows what the range of outcomes should be for my facts. And a young attorney who's only handled a handful of divorces doesn't have a wide body of experience to draw from in giving you the benefit of that experience. And while it's true, every young attorney needs to get experience somewhere, um, you have to decide whether that's going to be your case. And, you know, I know with your partners, Nancy, I know uh, with Scott Brook does some family law, um, Andrea Jacobs, she does immigration law. You only do family law, correct? I do exclusively marital and family law. I was board certified as an expert in family law in 2012. And it's something I'm very proud of. Um, there's a very small percentage of attorneys uh, in the state of Florida who are board certified in marital and family law. And uh, that expertise does give my clients the um, assurance that I know everything there is to know about family law, that I stay up with it uh, on a weekly basis. I read the appellate opinions. If something new has happened in family law, um, I know about it right away. And for people who have complicated finances, people who have a lot of money at stake, people who have their children at stake, you wanna have somebody who really understands the nuances of the law who can give you that guidance. And um, I only practice family law and family law mediation and family law collaboration uh, and have limited my practice to that for the last 15 years. I do have a background in civil litigation. I did have to handle a few personal injury cases when, <laughs> Sorry I, worked, about that. when I worked for a, for a law firm that did that. Um, and I, I did realize that was not my cup of tea. Right. Um, I took hundreds of cases to trial uh, in um, property damage cases for oh, insurance wow. subrogation. Um, so I, that's where I really um, honed my trial skills, but mostly in very small property damage cases that were in overwhelmingly in county court. A few of them were significant um, financial numbers, so they ended up being in circuit court, and a couple of them were even jury trials. Um, in which I was very successful overall. But, um, you know, family law is my real love. Uh, it's something that I developed a passion for because, like you, I really like helping people. And I, helping people from a wide diverse, diversity of backgrounds, everything from different socioeconomic statuses to ethnic, religious, and every kind of background you can imagine. And... I, I love helping people and I like helping families. So I learned early on that I had a knack for family law and that I had a passion for it. And that's why I 15 or so years ago started specializing in it and not taking any other kind of case. Well, Nancy, I always enjoy talking with you. Can you let anybody out there know how they can reach you if they have any questions? Well, the best way to reach us is, of course, by coming in to see us. You can call for a consultation at 954-344-7737. We also have a very comprehensive website that will give you lots of information about collaborative divorce, mediation, and traditional litigation, and everything about what you need to know about family law uh, in a very general way at our website, which is www.bjblawyers.com. Well, again, thank you so much, Nancy, for being here. We're going to have our next show on April 30th. 
I'm going to have Brian Koch from Greenberg Troig. He's a business litigator, just got out of a three-week trial, and I'm looking forward to seeing my friend Brian on April 30th. Thank you, everybody, for watching, listening. Uh, after this broadcast, I will be putting everything on podcast through iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. If you have any questions for me, of course, my name is Jeff Edelman, number 954-341-2777. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Jeff.